from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Keeper of the Key by August Erleth Being the Statement of Nayland Colum The manuscript of Nayland Colum discovered in a bottle in Colum's cabin by Captain Robertson of the Sana is preserved in the British Museum. Hitherto, publication has been denied, but since certain aspects of the manuscript appear to have bearing on recent events in the South Pacific, the manuscript has been released for publication. The most merciful thing in the world is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity and it was not meant that we should voyage far. H.P. Lovecraft There is so little time to set down what I must write, to leave this record of the strange events which began in London not so very long ago, so little time because even now the sea and the wind rage around the ship, and we are delivered to him because we are in his element. If indeed what I fear is true, I have held, and the professor has said that there is no knowing, but what after all is truth, and what is legend, and which parts of the one rightfully belong to the other. There are legends which are older than man. How then did we come by them, if there were not some intelligence apart from man's to bring them down? Man has modified them, changed them, fitted them into his own pattern. But the ancient writings remain, the age-old legends of the human race, the tales, vague and unconnected though they may be, of vast cataclysmic events, of weird and terrible forces and beings. It began, as I have written only several weeks ago in London, though time seemed longer than that, so crowded with events was the interval between my Outre novel, The Watchers on the Other Side, had not long been published, but had already received the kind of minor success which can come to a novel which is not quite socially aware enough to be called serious, and yet not wholly light enough to be classified as mere entertainment. Critics had acclaimed it, book reviewers had helped it along with mild praise, and the public, sated with the ordinary run of mysteries and puzzle novels, had taken it to their hearts with enthusiasm. I was, in fact, preparing to move from my comparatively humble flat in Soho, when late one night I was aroused from my desk, at which I was laboriously trying to piece together a second novel in the same vein, by a cautious knock on my door. I rose, somewhat tiredly, and opened it to an elderly gentleman whose aspect was kind without being benign, and yet also given without being menacing. His hair was long and white, but his face was clean-shaven. His nose was strongly Roman, his chin almost prognathous. His eyes I could not see, for he wore dark glasses with shields at the sides, thus completely concealing his eyes. Above his eyes his brows were unruly and graying. His voice when he spoke was cultured. I am Professor Laban Shrewsbury, and I am looking for the author of The Watchers on the Other Side. I stepped aside and said, Come in, please. Thank you, Mr. Collum. He came into my cluttered flat, seated himself, and without preamble, made himself comfortable by throwing back his cape-like coat, exposing a rather old-fashioned high collar and a flowing tie and folding his hands about the head of his cane, he began to speak. 
I should perhaps have written to ask whether I might call on you, Mr. Collum, but time is so short. And it occurred to me that the author of a book like yours would be adventurous enough by nature to understand. Do you mind if I ask you certain questions? Forgive me. I have already observed that you are at work on a new novel, meant to be a successor to the watchers on the other side, and that it, it is not going well, I can guess. But it is just possible that I may be of some slightish assistance to you in this regard, though not before some time has elapsed. But I should like now, if you do not object, to ask you a question or two about the watchers on the other side. By all means, I said, curiously impressed by my visitor. Tell me, did you write that novel out of imagination alone? The question was perhaps a natural one. I smiled. You are paying tribute to my poor skill, I said. But of course the answer is no. I drew upon the ancient legends as much as possible. And struck upon the kernel of truth? In legends, Professor? My smile held even at the risk of giving offense to him. Every legend, all lore, has at base some truth, however distorted it may be in the process of being handed down from one generation to the next. And there are those strange and provocative parallels in the legends of various peoples. You have encountered them, but no matter. Tell me one other thing. Have you always, since publication of your novel, felt entirely secure as to your person? Of course, I answered without hesitation. But an afterthought stirred me. There had been evenings. I think not, said my visitor with compelling self-confidence. On several occasions you have been followed, or should I say stalked, by stealthy habitants of a world of which you never dreamed, save in the fiction which flowed from your pen by such coincidence. You see, I know, Mr. Collum, because on two of those occasions I myself followed your followers. A pity you could not have seen them. You would not have been able to recall their like, and you would not have forgotten the disturbing, frog-like aspects of their features and bodies. I stared at him in amazement. I had the distinct impression that I was being followed on considerably more than one occasion. I had sought to dismiss it as a figment of my overactive imagination, but failed. So I had concluded at last that my followers were from among the dregs of Whitechapel, Wapping, or Limehouse, and this in turn had inspired my determination to leave Soho behind. Quite as if he read my thoughts, my visitor said, but they would follow you wherever you went, Mr. Collum. I know. Strangely, I had the inexplicable conviction that he did know, that perhaps he alone might provide me with a means of escape. I know you are adventurous, he went on. I know you are possessed of more than ordinary courage. I have some knowledge of your exploits on two exploring expeditions in which you took part. I do not, therefore, come unprepared. But admittedly, these exploits and your adventurous nature are not sufficient to interest me of themselves. No, but in combination with the fact that it was you, Nayland Collum, who wrote The Watchers on the Other Side, these facts are important to my purpose. In a very modest sense, I too am an explorer, but my explorations are not of the more mundane kind. I am not concerned with the mysterious and hidden places of the earth except only superficially and in so far as they are connected to the areas outside in which my real interest lies. But there's hidden somewhere on this earth a place I must find, and I've only now settled upon a clue to the keeper of the key to this place. In what region is it? I asked. Could I be certain I would not need to seek it? It might be in the Andes, it might be in the South Pacific, it might be in Tibet or Mongolia, it might be in Egypt or the deserts of Arabia, it might even be in London, but let me tell you for what I am seeking. It is the place of concealment where Cthulhu lies waiting to rise again and spread his spawn over the earth and perhaps its sister planets. 
Cthulhu. But Cthulhu is a legend, a creation of the imagination of the American writer Lovecraft, I protested. You say so. So do others. But consider the parallels which exist, the representation of godlike beings of evil, which are so strangely similar in the creative life of the natives of Polynesia and the Incas of Peru, the ancient inhabitants of the Tigris-Euphrates Valley and the Aztecs of Mexico. There is no need to go on. No, do not interrupt me. He went on to speak of legends and ancient lore with a grimly forbidding earnestness and a persuasiveness which aroused first my doubts about their own reality and at last my unwilling belief. He spoke of certain evil cults which had come down from pre-human eons, surviving in strange, out-of-the-way places, servants of the ancient ones, almost inconceivable beings of dread, who had fought against the elder gods in their far place among the stars of Orion and Taurus, and had been expelled to alien stars and planets. Great Cthulhu, waiting in sleep within some fastness, which might be the sunken sea kingdom of Rilje, Hastor the Unspeakable, come from the lake of Hali in the Hades, Nilarhotep the fearful messenger of the ancient ones, Shub Nigarath, the goat with a thousand young, symbol of fertility, Ithakwa, ruler of the air, akin to the fabled Windigo, Yog Sohoth, the one in awe and one in awe not subject to strictures of time or space, who was greater than all the other ancient ones, all dreaming in hidden places of the time when they can rise again against the elder gods and once more rule and command earth and the sister planets and stars of the universe of which earth is but an infinitesimal part. He spoke of the servants of the ancient ones, of the deep ones, the Vormis, the abominable Maigo, the Shogoths, the Shantaks, of the mysteriously unmapped lands of Nakai, Kadath in the cold waste, Carcosa, and the Yahai Nathli, of the rivalry between Cthulhu and Hastur and their followers. And yet, somehow, I understood that he withheld more knowledge than he imparted. I listened in growing wonder increasingly aware that there was about my visitor a strangely disquieting aspect which was evident even above the most hypnotic compulsion of his voice and manner, the conviction his bearing and his words conveyed, an intuitively perceived force which lent weight and authority to his quiet recital. I listened, listened without interruption while he mentioned the old books and moldering papers which contained the clues to the reality behind the legends the Noctic Manuscripts, the Auspression Colton of Von Junst, the Comte Erlet's Cults de Goose, the Villiers text, and finally the fabulous rare Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul Azared. He had been speaking of these hidden things, drawing upon some arcana of knowledge which was obviously his own because of an impressive amount of research. For some time, when abruptly he cut himself off in the middle of a sentence. He sat motionless in an attitude of intent listening. Ah, he breathed quietly. Then he rose and took liberty of putting out the light. Do you hear, Mr. Collum? I strained to listen in the pregnant darkness. Was it my imagination, or did I hear a curious shuffling and sound, almost an uncertain hopping, moving out of the hall beyond my flat and down the steps. They have followed me here, said Professor Shrewsbury. Come. He moved to a window overlooking the entrance to the building. I came to his side and together we looked down. Out of the building came not one but two strangely hunched figures who seemed to shuffle and hop along and passing under a misty light in the street revealed oddly repellent features, fish-like if I were to judge. If I were to say to you, whispered Professor Shrewsbury at my side, that there went two of the deep ones, would you still believe that I was the victim of my own wishful imagination, Mr. Collum? I don't know, I answered, likewise in a whisper. 
but I knew that what walked away into a London fog below was something incredibly evil. The awe of it seemed even now to linger in the street. How did you know they were here? I asked suddenly. I knew it as well as I know this book. He picked up a book from my desk, despite the darkness, or this page of manuscript. This too he picked up, or this pen. And even now we have not been deserted, Mr. Collum, by no means. They have no intention of leaving us to our own devices. Perhaps they suspect my purpose. I do not know. And what is your purpose? I managed to ask, somewhat surprised at his uncanny vision in the darkness of an unfamiliar room. I need someone like you to accompany me in a search for the keeper of the key. I warn you that the course will be fraught with dangers, not only to the body but to your very soul, that the instructions you will receive are bound to seem mad to you, but yet must be followed to the letter, without question, that we may very well not return. I hesitated. His challenge was direct and uncompromising. I did not for a moment doubt his sincerity or integrity. Where would he lead me? I wondered. We are bound for the port of Aden, Mr. Collum, he said, but perhaps you would like some further evidence of my ability to see and foresee the dangers which beset us. Pray do not be alarmed, Mr. Collum. My powers are small at best, and yet they may be surprising. He put on the light and turning to me, took off his black spectacles. My shock bordered momentarily on hysteria. The strangled cry that escaped me was lost in a terrified silence while I fought for self-control. For Professor Laban Shrewsbury, despite having given so convincing a demonstration of the excellence of his vision, had no eyes at all. Where his eyes should have been, there were only the dark pits of his empty sockets. Quite calmly, he resumed his spectacles. I am sorry to have disturbed your equanimity, Mr. Collum, he said quietly, but you have not yet given me your answer. I tried to match his calmness with my own. I will go, Professor Shrewsbury. I was certain you would, he answered. Now listen carefully. As soon as day breaks, you must undertake to secure your possessions against the long absence. We shall take every precaution against loss, but it is quite probable that you will not return for some time, months, perhaps a year, perhaps more. Does that surprise you? No, I replied truthfully enough. Very good. We shall set out in two days from Southampton. Can you be ready in that time? I believe so. Now, I must tell you we have strange allies in our quest, Mr. Collum, and even stranger properties in combat. As he spoke, he took from his pocket a little feel of golden mead, which he pressed upon me. Guard this carefully, for it has a property taken in the smallest quantity of extending the range of all your senses and of enabling your astral self to move about independently in your sleep. Next, he gave me a small five-pointed star which he identified as a kind of amulet which would assure my protection as long as I carried it on my person from all such things as the deep ones, though it was powerless against the ancient ones themselves. He went on to add a little stone whistle to the curious things he had already bestowed upon me. In many ways, Mr. Collum, this whistle is your most potent weapon. When the time comes that you are in mortal danger without other escape, if you will take a little of the mead, keep the star stone in your possession, and blow this whistle, calling forth immediately thereafter these words, Ya Ya Hastur, the Bihaki birds will come and transport you to a place of safety. If the minions of the ancient ones are everywhere, what haven is left? I asked. There is one where we can be safe. And yet we are not there. We are not on Saleno. He smiled tolerantly at my incredulous astonishment. I do not blame you for thinking me deranged, Mr. Collum. I assure you most solemnly that what I say is the literal truth. Hashtor and his minions are not subject to the same laws of time and space which bind us. Their summoning formula is heard, believe me, wherever you may be, and answered. 
He paused reflectively and studied my face. Do you now wish to withdraw, Mr. Collum? I shook my head slowly, fascinated against all reason, against my will, against my judgment. Can you meet me at Southampton the day after tomorrow? Our ship is the Princess Ellen. We set out at nine in the morning. I will be there, I said. A sum of money will be deposited to your account before I leave London, Mr. Collum. You will find it sufficient. Pray go on board the Princess Ellen even if I am not there. I will join you in good time and do not be alarmed at my failure to appear, should the hour seem late. Reservations have been made. He hesitated. And let me impress upon you once more the danger which attends you. Believe me, it is never far from you. They know, since your book has come out, that you are dangerous to them, or may become so. So saying, he took his departure, and I was left alone with the confusion of my thoughts and the conviction that I stood on the threshold of an adventure stranger than any ever conceived by the mind of man. The utter monotony of the prosaic world of every day seldom impresses itself upon one until the establishment of a sharp contrast affords a comparative basis. There is, too, the very real danger that one may see and understand that the patine of the mundane which overlays all things is but a mask for the constant struggle which goes on unceasingly between recognizable forces of good and the nebulous, almost incredible evil which lies forever in wait just beyond the rim of awareness, lying in wait not only for the soul of man but for the world itself, the world and possession of its lands and seas and beyond that of the star spaces and all that lies in the cosmos. I lay for a long time that night contemplating the things Professor Laban Shrewsbury had said to me and the even more appalling things at which he had hinted. The deep hours of night lend themselves well to the eerie, the enchanting, the terrible, but the core of reason, the solid substructure of all the practical knowledge which a man takes in for his first thirty years is not easily set aside by any fund of new and conflicting knowledge. My visitor had been virtually little more than a creature of the night, however persuasive his story. I knew nothing of him, though I held in my possession the curious things he had given me. There were, however, certain avenues of information. My old friend, Henry Pilgore, possessed one of the most comprehensive of reference libraries. Despite the lateness of the hour, I telephoned him, putting in a trunk call to the Somerset village where he lived. He bade me to hang on while he sought out such information as he might have, but I did not have to wait long. Professor Shrewsbury was listed. Pilgore read his biographical sketch of his home in Arkham, Massachusetts, of his one-time connection with Miskatonic University, of his erratic post-teaching existence, of his apparently wide travels, of his scholarly work and investigation into the myth pattern of latter-day primitives with his special reference to the real Ye text. And finally, he disappeared in September 1938, presumed dead. Presumed dead. The words rang in my thoughts for a long moment. But I could not doubt that, whatever he might be, my visitor had most assuredly been Professor Laban Shrewsbury. What of the thing he had left for me? The mead, he had said, had strange properties. I opened the field cautiously, touched a drop of it to my finger, and tasted it. It was flat to sweet, ambrosial on second taste, but it gave me no sensation at all not even one akin to the mild stimulation of weak wine. Disappointed, I replaced the feel and sat down once more in the darkness of my room. Far away, Big Ben struck two o'clock in the morning. I had but one more day in London, scarcely that, if I meant to be at Southampton docks by nine o'clock of the day following. But now doubts began to assail me. I began to doubt the wisdom of my decision. I began to consider my commitment folly and then I became aware of a subtle alteration 
in my sensory experience. I was slowly becoming cognizant of a greatly heightened perception on all planes. Sounds common to the street outside were clearly heard and accurately interpreted. The smells, the odors, and the perfumes of the night infiltrating my quarters were made vastly stronger. But at the same time, I experienced an even more significant quality of the mead of which I had partaken. My intuitive perception was increased beyond the bounds of what I might have considered possible, increased to such an extent that I became keenly aware of the hidden watchers posted not only in the building, but in the street, and even hundreds of yards away. For they were there. I cannot say by what marvelous property of the mead I was enabled to see as clearly as if they stood before me the evilly frog-like and fish-like features of those oddly repellent creatures in the guise of men. But see them I did, and I knew at that moment that everything my visitor had told me was true beyond question, no matter how fantastic his words had sounded. And this realization was fraught with the coldest and most soul-shaking terror, for the limitless vistas of ancient and potent horror the alien concepts, the monstrous beings, which were implicit in the hidden word of Professor Shrewsbury's revelation, were paralyzing to mankind. What happened then is incapable of any logical or scientific explanation. I passed over into a sleeping state, during which I had a most vivid dream, in which I saw myself packing my belongings for the impending voyage writing a letter to my publisher to explain that I would be away from London for several months, instructing my brother by letter also to handle such affairs of mine as needed care during my absence, and finally slipping away from my quarters in a patent and successful effort to elude my followers. Furthermore, I made my way speedily to Waterloo Station. Once I had complied with the formalities incidental to traveling abroad, and entrained for Southampton, where I presently found myself at the docks and on board the Princess Ellen, though not without a further frightening shock at the realization that though I had eluded my London pursuers, I had other similar watchers following me in Southampton. Now, all this, I say, was a dream of the most vivid sort. Woolly, unlike any dream which I had ever previously experienced, it was so real, in fact, that it seemed to me that the figure in the chair was the dream, and the dream the reality. Or could both have been? I remember later Professor Shrewsbury comment about the strange properties of the golden mead, which was certainly, I am now convinced, no invention of man's, properties never conceived by mankind, but brought from some far place even perhaps from out of this world, from the hidden places in the cosmos where the ancient ones still lurk, waiting forever to return to the paradise from which they were cast out eons ago. For I woke up, not in my familiar Soho quarters, but in my cabin on board the Princess Ellen, with Professor Shrewsbury beside me. By what outre powers he possessed behind his formidable black spectacles. He divined the reason for my amazement. I see you have sampled the mead, Mr. Collum, he said quietly. He was not angry. You will then have some appreciation of its properties. It was not a dream then? He shook his head. Whatever it was you dreamed was quite true. The mead enabled part of you to separate from its counterpart you were thus empowered to see yourself doing what you must do in order to fulfill your commitment. Perhaps it was as well that you did try the mead. It gave you the means to understand how closely indeed you were being watched and followed, and it lent you furthermore the wit to elude your pursuers. But we shall not be long without pursuit. You may be sure of that. He waited until I collected myself somewhat adjusting to the situation which I so surprisingly now found myself. Then he continued, We are bound for the port of Aden in Arabia, as I told you two nights ago. 
From a den we will strike inward either toward the site of ancient Timna, which you may remember from Pliny, who referred to it as the city of forty temples, of what nature some of them we may well wonder, or to the region around Salah, the summer capital of the Sultan of Muscar and Oman, in search of a fabulous subterranean city, a buried city which has been designated as the nameless city by more than one authority. These are the areas once inhabited by the Hymerites, 20 to 30 centuries ago. In these vicinities we are likely to find the most legendary Irem, the city of pillars which was seen by the Arab Abdul Azared during his sojourn in the great southern desert. The Roba El Khalil, or empty space of the ancients, which is also the Dana, or crimson desert, of the modern Arabs, are held to be inhabited by protective evil spirits and death-dealing monsters. You will find it increasingly significant that we repeatedly encounter these so-called legends of evil spirits and monsters, particularly since they are curiously corroborative of the central thesis of the Cthulhu myth pattern. Wherever we go and in whatever direction we reach, you will ultimately conclude, even as I did long ago, that this is not coincidence. I assured him that I had already come to a surprisingly great degree of belief in the astonishing things he had striven to impart to me. Manifestly full belief depended upon such further examination as might be possible for me to make, though I had considerable apprehension as to what the future might hold in store for me. He went on now to speak of the work of the Arab Abdul Azared, the book Al Azif, which had become the Necronomicon. None other had ever come so close to revealing the secrets of Cthulhu and the cults of Cthulhu, of Yag Sohoth, and indeed of all the ancient ones. The book originally secretly circulated after Azared's mysterious disappearance and subsequent death in 731 AD hinted of things so terrible that the mind of man could scarcely conceive of them, and conceive it would instantly elect to reject them rather than adopt into the realm of the possible any potential event of such a nature as to refute many of the most fundamental principles by which the races of mankind exist, and relegate man to a position of even greater insignificance than his present moat-like place in the cosmos. The work, moreover, was of such a nature that all ecclesiastical authorities, regardless of affiliation, condemned it, and had so successfully fought the spread by the most rigid suppression that only a very few copies of the Greek and Latin versions of the text were to be had, and these few copies were all under lock and key in various institutions. The Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the British Museum, the Library of the University of Buenos Aires, the Widener Library of Harvard, the Library of Miskatonic University at Arkham. The Arabic original was lost centuries ago, at about 1228, when Aulus Wormius made his Latin translation of the book. Professor Shrewsbury had read the entire work in both the Latin and the Greek versions, and he hoped to discover somewhere in Arabia a copy of the Arabic if not, indeed, the original manuscript, which he held had not disappeared, but had rather remained in Alzared's possession, a copy which had been used by Wormius, having vanished instead. This was conjecture on the professor's part, but there was sound reason for such a conclusion, and it began to dawn upon me that possession of this priceless manuscript was, doubtless, the immediate goal behind the expedition to Arabia. That there was something more lying in the back of Professor Shrewsbury's mind, I could not doubt, and of this he was clearly unwilling to speak, for he gave no hint of its nature. Indeed, it was borne in upon me presently that, however open and above board Professor Shrewsbury was, there was much left to be desired in his palimpsest of information.
regarding the Cthulhu mythos and such adjunct of data as he chose to speak about. What he sought, he confidently expected to find either an Irem or the unidentified nameless city, which might be identical with cities at either the site of Timna or Salala. At this point he offered me transcripts of certain portions of the Necronomicon and sat waiting patiently while I read, skimming hastily the various papers he had handed me, but reading enough nevertheless to understand the significance of the portions he had transcribed. Whosoever speaketh of Cthulhu shall remember that he but seemeth dead, he sleeps, and yet he does not sleep. He has died, and yet he is not dead. Asleep and dead, though he is, he shall rise again. Again it should be shown that. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. And more. Great Cthulhu shall rise from Ilye. Hastor the Unspeakable shall return from the Dark Star, which is in the Hades near Aldebaran, the Red Eye of the Bull. Nilar Hotep shall howl forever in the darkness where he abideth. Shub Nigarath shall spawn its thousand young, and they shall spawn in turn and take dominion over all wood nymphs, satyrs, leprechauns, and the little people. Your Igors Zar and Ithakwa shall ride the space among the stars. And yet more. He who hath the five-pointed stone shall find himself able to command all beings which creep, swim, crawl, walk, or fly even to the source from which there is no returning. There was far more. Oddly disturbing paragraphs concerning the return of the ancient ones, the devotion of the minions who served them, some in the guise of men, others in guise as far stranger. There were yet more names reaching out from these pages to transfix with primal fear. Upusathoth, Azathoth, the blind idiot god, Umar at Tawil, Sigakwa, Kathuga, and yet others all suggestive of a weird and horrible godhead, of a terror fraught penelope of great gigantic creatures in no wise similar to man as ancient and as quite possibly more ancient than Earth itself, or even the solar system so familiar to the astronomers of our time. Indeed, after I had read some of the pages he gave me, I had little wish to read on. I begged tiredness as an excuse and handed them back to him. My companion thereupon bade me sleep, while he, who apparently had no need of sleep, went on with certain preparations he had yet to make. But before I slept, he took me up on deck and walked to the rail with me, bidding me only to look about me and observe the water closely. We were not alone in our course, for a school of large fish, which I at first hazarded were porpoises, showed now and then about the ship. But at my mention of porpoises, Professor Shrewsbury only smiled sardonically and said nothing. It came to me on the edge of sleep soon after that we were not likely to encounter a school of porpoises so little away out of Southampton, and I knew then, I think, what it was that swam so furtively about the Princess Ellen, even if I was reluctant to admit it to myself at first. And when I slept, I dreamed. But this time the dreams were of a different caliber from the remarkable waking dream inspired by the Golden Mead, a curious dream pattern of dreadful and horrible things of the deep ones who could follow on land or in the water, of great bat-winged creatures flying overhead, of something amorphous and awe-inspiring which lurked deep down in the sea, of vast sunken continents, of lost buried cities, ancient as a drifting sand, concealing something of great value in our need, a dream of flight and pursuit, and of an inevitable ending in which there was no escape from the ever more frightful creatures who kept so doggedly upon our trail. I pass over the remainder of our trip, which was relatively uneventful. True, there was never a day when there was not to be seen something in the sea, a strangely humped back, which was not as fish-like as one would have liked, a shuddersome webbed foot, which was horribly like a human hand with its fingers webbed, 
a terrifying glimpse of a face half human, half frog, with gleaming basilic eyes and a frightful travesty of a mouth slashed across its leather-like skin. But these were only the slightest, most momentary glimpses, and it was difficult to tell how much was actually seen and how much was imagined out of the strange facts I had confronted. And since the ship kept serenely on its course, the other passengers gave no sign of having seen anything untoward. It was easy to conclude that what I did see, however, disquieting was grown in large part from a prefervid imagination which, in the circumstances, was understandable enough. Likewise, our disembarking at Eden was without incident. It was not Professor Shrewsbury's intention to remain in the port city, for as he explained, the Deep Ones could find us as readily in a port city as on the sea, but were loath to venture far inland, away from water, since this was a necessary element for them. And while they could sustain themselves for some time without water, a trek into desert country was not an undertaking destined to appeal to them. Nevertheless, said the professor with the utmost casualness, we must expect that other followers will soon be in our vicinity, and we must be prepared for any eventuality. Guides and porters for our expedition have been arranged for by capable and waited for us farther up the coast at Damkut. Once we had reached Damkut, some days later it took but a few hours to have all in readiness for our departure. Several times Professor Shrewsbury examined the streets and alleys of Damkut in the vicinity with marked anxiety, but at last convinced that there were nearby none other than certain suspicious individuals who might have belonged to the Deep Ones and who could not harm any professor of the pine pointed star, he gave the signal to begin moving from the city. Our goal was the great unexplored waste of the Rub al Kali. Alzared's Roba al Kalaihi. We were first to make Salala, and from there intended to strike northward toward other potential sites of the nameless city mentioned by Abdul Azared. That my employer had certain definite ideas about the site of the nameless city, I could not doubt, but he revealed nothing, so we set out just precisely as many other expeditions had set out before us by camel caravan, though there had been one period of hesitation during which Professor Shrewsbury had contemplated making an earlier trip to Mareb by air. But since this would not allow for any divagations from the main line of travel, he discarded the tentative plan. Of the trip across the desert, from Duquat to Salala and beyond, I know not what to write. Certainly the events of that expedition could have been coincidental in their happening. I say they could have. But in the light of our purpose, and in that of the intentions of those little known creatures who sought to prevent our reaching our goal, I do not think they were. On our first night in the desert, we lost one of our guides. Both my employer and I followed his tracks away from camp. He had been running, but his tracks had ceased suddenly, and he had literally vanished into the air leaving no trace of his going. No one had observed him rising from his place in the night. Our second night was uneventful. On our third we lost a porter. This time Professor Shrewsbury and I found the poor fellow's body. We had found out beyond the place at which his footsteps stopped, and we found the body almost concealed in sand. A hasty examination showed that he would seem to have been dropped from a singular height, for many of his bones were savagely broken. We said nothing of his death to the rest of the party, though his disappearance added to the guide spread uneasiness among the men. Desertions were not uncommon. The guide's vanishings had been accepted as a desertion, without question. The porters had taken place too far from the caught, and yet we were still on well-traveled roads, and the theory that he had deserted satisfied some of the men. But the uneasiness which had taken root among them was by no means confined to them, nor was it alone due to the loss of two of their number. I myself had felt it. A succession of events quite apart from the disappearance of the two men stirred it beyond my ability to suppress it. The most curious event was not 
in final analysis, the vanishing of our men. It was the intolerable conviction of being watched by invisible watchers. This was naturally most strong at night, but we were never without it, even under the glaring sun. And by day it was accompanied by strange hallucinations reported by guides and porters alike of slithering creatures resembling crocodiles darting about at a little distance from our caravan and manifestly following us. These could very easily have been desert animals which could have grown into the habit of following caravans except for the fact that they were not identifiable as native animals of any kind. They were of varying size some of them but a few inches long, some many feet in length, and pronounced reptilian, and finally that some of them appeared to be garbed in unrecognizable costumes, sight of which only served to further excite the members of our caravan. These strange creatures would seem to have been at last half unreal, for they appeared and disappeared with such agility that more than once they seemed to vanish before our eyes. They were very probably not malign. None ever approached too closely to the camp or caravan, and all vanished at once on movement toward them. Professor Shrewsbury shot at them several times, but with astonishingly ill effect. He struck none of them, though there were times when he could hardly have missed, yet he did. Their following had an unusual effect on my employer. Far from becoming uneasy at their presence, he seemed to actually enjoy having them near us, and plagued the men constantly as to their numbers, had they noticed any increase, and the like. We were perhaps seventeen days out of Dumquat, and already well past the Lala, before any increase in the numbers of our unusual companions was reported. By that time we had lost, in all, six men, and those who remained were becoming extremely restive. This was not alone because of the dwindling number of the men on the expedition, but because, as their spokesman pointed out, we approached the forbidden and accursed region of the country, one which all Arabians shunned in mortal fear. My employer, however, was blind to any appeal. He confided that he had expected rebellion and that this in itself was an excellent sign, for the writings of Abdul Azared were specific and that the region of the nameless city was shunned by the natives. His admins before the entreaty of the men that he alter his course was strengthened by the occurrence of an even more significant event, though significance was lost on me at first. It was late that night when my employer woke me. He was unusually excited. Come, he whispered. I went with him wonderingly. He knelt down beside one of the tents and held his palm down above the surface of the sand. Feel, he commanded. I did so and was aware, as I had already been aware about my ankles, of the movement of an ice-cold current of air flowing steadily across the surface of the sand. Do you feel it? he asked. The wind? Yes, what is it? Alzared spectral wind. There is an account of it in the Necronomicon. There is yet another in the writings of the late H. P. Lovecraft. Both pertain to the same source, the nameless city. From which direction does it come? Almost due north. That will be our route tomorrow. We will not feel the wind by day, but at night we will know it again. If we follow it, it will lead us to our goal. Then our real work begins, Mr. Collum. Only then and I am very much afraid that you and I will be quite alone at it, so it behoove us to make sure of our camels and such supplies as are absolutely essential to the two of us for the trip back to Salala. We turned away from the direction of the border of Oman next morning and struck out towards the heart of the Rub al-Khali. There was much muttering among the men. Many dark scowls came out upon their faces and remained there throughout the day but they were still with us by nightfall, whatever their fears. Two, there were with us an increasing number of our strange desert companions, but these showed a curious aversion to the oasis at which we encamped for the night. Once again in the night my employer 
sought the spectral wind and found it much stronger now with sufficient velocity to ripple our tents. But he and I were not the only members of the party to be aware of it. In a very short time after it had begun to blow, which was not long after sundown, the men had become cognizant of it, and feeling it, they gave vent to such a bedlam of complaint that Professor Shrewsbury was compelled to talk to them, which he did in Arabic, explaining to me later that what he had said and what had passed between them. We cannot go on, the leader of the men had said. Why not? Feel. It is the death wind. I feel it. Will you remain here while Mr. Colum and I go on? The leader consulted the men who were divided in their opinion. Nevertheless, he believed that the majority of them would stay. Very well, Professor Shrewsbury turned to me. We'll take that special equipment I have, lash it securely to a camel, and make our own camels ready. You and I will go now. The wind began approximately two hours after sundown, traveling much faster than you or I can travel. Nevertheless, if we make haste, we should reach its source before dawn, for it will return the way it came. Within an hour we were moving through the limitless desert into the wind out of the north. We traveled as speedily as our camels allowed us to. Professor Shrewsbury completely confident of reaching his goal at or before dawn. The night was not hot, but the wind into which we rode was an arctic wind, utterly alien to the desert and redolent with an unfamiliar odors and fragrances. Stars were mired in the heavens, small wonder that Arabs were among the earliest known astronomers. Yet I could not help wondering, looking up at them, whether indeed there lay in those spaces the colossal beings of the mythology about which my employer had spoken, the elder gods, the ancient ones, whose very struggle did indeed parallel the ancient legends of mankind, even before the setting down of the banishment from heaven of Satan and his followers. Shortly after midnight, the wind changed its course. It was indeed returning, even as Professor Shrewsbury had predicted it would, for now it swept northward, rapidly gaining momentum and force, nor did it diminish in velocity until just before dawn, when there occurred a perceptible slackening of its vigor. By this time, I was exceedingly tired, but Professor Shrewsbury urged his camel onward confident that the site of the nameless city lay not far ahead. Nor was his confidence misplaced, for shortly before the oddly cold wind died away, he gave a shout and pointed ahead to what seemed to be a solitary stone in the expanse of sand over which the sun was soon to rise blazingly. I could have known by the terrifying aura of malignancy which had descended upon me that we had come at last to the goal which Professor Shrewsbury had sought. Here indeed was a hidden city, and the occasional stones which were revealed so fleetingly by the shifting sand spoke somberly of a civilization ancient before the Christian era had begun. I wondered how my employer hoped to descend into this hidden city. He had certainly no chance whatsoever of penetrating to its street level by means of the picks and shovels we had brought for manifestly the city was buried too deeply. But this problem concerned me only briefly, for Professor Shrewsbury made no effort to dismount. Instead, he followed the now fast failing wind, urging his camel anxiously forward until he had distanced me, leaving me still threading my way among the pinnacles of that buried ruin. When at last he dismounted, he was considerably ahead of me. I found him beside a cavernous opening skillfully hidden among the sands. As I too dismounted, the last of the wind died away, hushing around my feet into the opening which led down sounds covered steps. Out of it yawned an obliterating blackness, and from it rose a coolness which spoke of moisture below. But Professor Shrewsbury was already unloading the third camel, which had been tied to my own and had hindered my keeping up with my employer. Is this the place? I asked. This is the place, he answered confidently. I know because I have been here. But why then this search? I asked. 
because I have never come over land, but only by air. Come, let me show you. He led the way down the steps, from the desert, which was already extremely hot in the rays of the rising sun, to this cool cavernous place with the steppe as from tropical to subarctic regions. Moreover, the air grew even cooler and more damp as we descended, and it was borne in upon me presently that once the initial sequence of stone steps had been descended, we were in a kind of natural cavern, which lay because of the steep stair declivities over which we passed far deeper beneath the sands than we might otherwise have imagined. Perhaps at some time it had been crowned by a superstructure long since destroyed, but now it shone and glowed eerily in the beams of my employer's flashlight. I was struck almost at once by the evidence all around us of the ancient civilization which had once held sway here. Though many side passages led into the various rooms of the central cavern, all were far too low to permit of a man's a standing upright. But wherever altars occurred, and it was patent that the cavern had been used as a temple, they were suggestively low, as if they were made for creatures which crawled rather than walked upright. The stone roof of the cavern had been worked on by stone cutters, and primitive artists had decorated the walls, which were filled with the most horribly disquieting drawings, depicting not man, but the events of a history in which none but saurian and reptilian creatures took part. The very name, I concluded with disturbing reluctance, as those crocodile-like beings, which had watched the approach of our caravan from afar, and accompanied us to the oasis where the remainder of our expedition still waited. My employer, however, appeared to have a further goal in view, for he walked rapidly from room to room in the cavern until he came to the end, and there he went around the altar and disclosed a stone door carved from the rock of the wall. This he opened with ease, revealing yet another flight of steps, a steep declivity leading down into hideously repellent depths, from which rose a kind of fetter not unpleasantly spiced, with odors suggestive of incense. Without hesitation, Professor Shrewsbury plunged into the gloom of that endless passage, for indeed it was endless. Our descent took over two hours, for the passage altered height, so that it was necessary from time to time to walk with the utmost care. We descended from level to level, until it seemed to me that we must indeed be inconceivably far below the surface of the earth at that place. Yet at last we reached a level floor. At first in a place where neither of us could quite stand upright, but presently by dint of shuffling along through a widening corridor in which much to my astonishment there were wooden cases of the fronts of a substance akin to glass and yet not glass but these were clearly cases which had never known the hand of man, artful in construction, coffin-like in size, and affixed to the walls and along the floor of the passage. My employer went from one to another of them eagerly, and at last stopped before one of them with a long, low sigh. He turned his flashlight full upon it and beckoned me forward. Do not be surprised at what you see, Mr. Collum, he cautioned me. I do not know what I expected to see, but what I did see could hardly have been any more startling, for certainly the last thing I expected to see beneath the pseudo-glass of the case was the body of a young man of my own time, surely of approximately my own age, and if his clothing were any criterion, either an Englishman or an American the balance in favor of the latter. Is this too a dream or an illusion? I cried. No, Mr. Collum, it is not, answered Professor Shrewsbury. Nor is this one, nor this. Good God, three of them? How did these corpses come here? Oh, they are not corpses. But they are surely not alive. Pray remember Alzaret's inexplicable couplet. That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. No, they are not dead. But paradoxical as it may seem, they are not alive either. They are deposited here 
to wait for the time when their life essence, their souls, their astrals, name it what you will, are brought back. For this is the secret of the Baikahi birds. They do not fly to Seleno, but here, to this domain of Hastor, where the bodies of these young men are thus preserved. Soon now, they themselves will return from Seleno, and together all of us will make the final journey of this incredible search, which was now come to the threshold of the secret. I thought of what he had said, recalling his words about the Bayaki, and the response to the stone whistle I carried in my pocket. But where, then, were they? I put my question into words. Some of them may be here, but they are in Kadath in the cold waste, on the Shun plateau of Len, and in certain other places, some within our own plain, some existing continuously on another plain. And who are these young men? The first one is Andrew Phelan. He helped me in Arkham. The second is Abel Keen. He too was helpful at Innsmouth. The third is Claiborne Boyd, who undertook a strange mission to Peru. And the fourth will be Nayland Coloma cried. Let us hope not, said my employer fervently. If we succeed here, it should no longer be necessary to make such means to escape pursuit. You knew they were here, I charged? How? Because I too was one of them for a while. And even before any of them came here, I spent almost 20 years in such a case. I am far older than you would believe, Mr. Collum. If we add those two decades, he turned away. But it is not our purpose to linger here. We must go on yet further. There are crypts below into which I have never seen. He paused only long enough to add to my burdens a share of his own, which were becoming too heavy for him. He then went on, and again we descended narrow stone steps. Again we crouched and crawled through narrower passages, moving from one level to another. How far we went into the bowels of the earth, I have no way of knowing. By the light on my watch, I saw that the hour was already well past noon, though I felt strangely neither hunger nor thirst. Far down, near the end of the passage, the walls revealed arresting paintings of the utmost and most extravagant grotesquerie. Here there was set down a sequence of scenes which must have depicted the nameless city in its distant past, though it seemed most peculiar that the scenes of the city were consistently done as by moonlight, so that they were elusively spectral in their effect. A scrutiny of the pictures, however, revealed a secret hidden world, subterranean beyond question where great cities flourished amidst high mountains and fertile valleys. This country existed side by side with the moonlit monoliths of the nameless city, shown now in decadence with the sacred reptiles dying away and their spirits hovering above, while ornately robed priests cursed the waters and the air. One terrible final scene showed an emaciated group of the saurian inhabitants of the nameless city setting upon and tearing apart a human being. Beyond this point, however, the gray walls and ceilings were devoid of all ornamentation, for which I was understandably grateful. We came at last to a great bronze door, open, upon which was set an inscription in Arabic, which my employer translated aloud. He who came hath returned. He who saw hath been blinded. He who set down the secrets hath been silenced. Here he shall abide forever, neither in darkness nor the light. Let none disturb him. He turned to me, his excitement obvious, even in the darkness of the room. Can it be other than the Arab Azared? he demanded, for he alone came, saw, and set down the secrets. He was killed, tortured and slain, beyond question, agreed Professor Shrewsbury calmly. Legend has it that he was snatched by an invisible monster in broad daylight and devoured horribly before a great audience. This is the story the 12th century biographer Eb Kali Khan handed down 
but it is more than possible that the devouring was an illusion and that he was brought here to undergo punishment and death for his temerity in revealing the secrets of the ancient ones. Come, we are going in. The bronze door resisted our efforts for some time, but at last it gave, opening into a small square room, which was barren of all furnishing, with the exception of a squat stone sarcophagus in the center of the room. Professor Shrewsbury advanced upon this without hesitation and moved back the lid, disclosing tattered remnants of clothing, a few fragments of bone and dust. Is it he? I asked. My employer nodded. And we have come all this way for this? Not alone this, Mr. Column. Be patient. What follows now informs us whether we succeed or fail. Tell me, you still have the mead? Yes. Take but a little of it. I followed his example. And now pray compose yourself. He will need to draw upon you for his coming. Drowsiness was already coming upon me. Under Professor Shrewsbury's guidance, I stretched out on the floor near the sarcophagus and almost immediately experienced the dream, similar in character to that first meat-inspired dream in my Soho quarters. Once again, I saw myself taking part in a drama, this time far more outre than the others, which had been prosaic enough in essence. I watched Professor Shrewsbury encircle the sarcophagus and both of us with a large band of blue powder, which he immediately set afire. This burned eerily but brightly, so that the entire room was illumined, and the sarcophagus stood out in high relief. My employer then constructed a series of cabalistic designs on the floor about the sarcophagus, again completely encircling it. Thereafter he took from his person certain documents which resembled those transcriptions from the Necronomicon he had given me to read and from one of them he recited in a clear voice him who knows the place of real Ye, him who holds the secret of far kadath him who keeps the key to cthulhu by the five-pointed star by the sign of kish by the ascent of the elder gods let him come forth this he recited three times at each adjuration completing a drawing on the floor at the conclusion of his recitation he waited. Now there occurred a most unusual and slightly disturbing phenomena. I felt myself surrendering something of myself, as were I drained of my very life force, and at the same time there was a movement above the sarcophagus, at first little more than a stirring of air, then a gradual misting, and then before my eyes the remnants and tatters of clothing in the sarcophagus began to lift up into the air and take ragged shape about the misting which is growing steadily denser losing its opacity for darkness so that presently there hung above the sarcophagus a spectral image a blasphemous caricature of a man which had neither body nor face but only a semblance of each with black glowing pits where eyes should have been beneath a torn burnous and a dark shapeless body very thin upon which the tatters of garments which long ago were flowing robes hung loosely. This terrifying apparition hung in the air, motionless. Professor Shrewsbury addressed it. Abdul Azared, where is Cthulhu? The specter raised a sleeve and indicated its mouth. There was no tongue, it could not speak. Professor Shrewsbury was not daunted. Is he at real yea? Receiving no immediate answer, he mouthed these unintelligible words, Cthulhu real J, which I understood later was a ritual phrase meaning, In his house at real J, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. This time, however, the apparition nodded just perceptibly. Where is real J? Once again, the horrible revenant of Abdul Azared pointed to its tongueless mouth. Construct a chart on the ceiling, directed Professor Shrewsbury. The apparition thereupon went through the motions of drawing a meticulously conceived chart upon the ceiling. Since it had nothing with which to draw, it could not make a mark of any kind. Yet so potent was the effect of the mead, it was manifest that Professor Shrewsbury followed the labored movement with ease, copying them on a piece of paper as the specter drew them. 
there emerged presently a complicated map which represented no known portion of the earth. But I understood, as my employer did, that Abdul Azared's conception of the earth was perhaps vastly different from our own, and that his reconstruction of any portion of the earth's surface was dependent upon the limited knowledge of his time, to which he might have added such private knowledge as he had amassed through methods which had gained him sufficient information to enable him to put together the al -Azif. Having finished his drawing, Professor Shrewsbury held it up before the apparition he had summoned from the gulf. Is this the place? The apparition nodded. And of these islands, which is the one above Rioye? The specter indicated a tiny dot on my employer's map, then made a cryptic gesture which Professor Shrewsbury immediately understood. Ah, uh, it sinks and returns. The specter once again inclined its head. Professor Shrewsbury was manifestly now satisfied with his interrogation, and he now turned to the subject which I felt all along lay in the back of his mind. Tell me, Azared, where is the lost al -Azif? There was no immediate reply to the professor's query. The apparition remained motionless for several seconds. Then its head made a low half-turn, which might have been a negative gesture or simply an attempt to see something invisible to other eyes. Is it in this room? pressed my employer. The specter nodded. Is it in the sarcophagus? The specter shook its head. The professor glanced rapidly around. There was no place of concealment, save in the walls or floor. The walls, he hazarded. Again, his eyes was confirmed. On the south, no. On the north, no. The east, yes. But now the apparition seemed to be trying to say something more in its eerie fashion. The pathetic, tongueless figure, eyeless too, for eyes and tongue, had been removed before death in the torture inflicted upon the mad Arab for his temerity in writing about the secrets of the ancient ones and their minions, appeared to wish grievously to say something of significance. The professor, seeing, tried to draw it out. Was it about the manuscript? A quick nod. Was the manuscript guarded? Yes. Were the guards here? No. Were they below? Yes. That was all? No, there was yet more. The manuscript was not complete? Yes, that was it. Some of it had been destroyed before al could conceal it? Yes. I will take what is left, said the professor. Return now whence you came, Abdul Azared. Immediately the lot tatters and the bone fragments fell together and collapsed. The mist settled like dust and vanished. The blue fires around the sarcophagus began to dim and die away. At the same time, strength flowed back into me. The professor rose from his knees, to which he had descended to copy that fantastic drawing constructed in the air against the ceiling and closed the sarcophagus. Then he strode to my side and shook me. Hurry now, Mr. Collum, he whispered. We have what we want. There is no time to be lost. We began then to examine the east wall of the room for the stone concealing the fragments of the manuscript of the al -Asif. It would be low, the professor reasoned, for the Arab would unquestionably have been bound or chained in some manner, and his ability to reach far up along the wall would have been curtailed. My employer worked with feverish haste, pausing from time to time to listen, so that it seemed we were examining the great stones for a long time before we came upon one loose enough to serve as a place of concealment. Yet, we had not long been, and behind the stone, we found the parchment paper of the al -Azif. These Professor Shrewsbury hastily thrust into his coat. Then we replaced the stone and together left the room, closing the great bronze door behind us. For a moment more, Professor Shrewsbury stood at the threshold listening, his head cocked a little towards the Stygian blackness at our right the great maw of darkness which hinted a still further mystery beyond the place to which we had come. It was then that the sound began. Hitherto the only noise which had reached our ears was a thin scuttering of sand borne along on the wind at the steps 
leading down from the desert above. But this had ceased soon after our advance into the nether regions, and we ourselves were then the authors of the only sounds pertinent to our descent which we heard. But now, emanating from some dread crypt even further below, there swelled and grew a sound which can only be described as a low moaning, accompanied by a rushing as of a night wind, a moaning as of many voices, but what was most hideously suggestive. The voices had a totally non-human quality, impossible to describe, save only as a sound fraught with the utmost horror. I saw by my watch that the hour of sundown was near, and felt at the same time the beginning once again of the spectral wind, which manifestly came from the far deeper than the subterranean caverns into which we had penetrated. I felt an overpowering urge to take flight, and yielded to it, but Professor Shrewsbury soon caught hold of me and stopped my precipitous escape. Wait, he urged. We cannot outrun it. With the stones we are safe. Let us take refuge in a side passage until the worst of the wind has exhausted itself. We accordingly crawled into one of the low auxiliary passages leading off from the main corridor and lay there in silence with our flashlights turned off. There was soon apparent in the quarter which we had left a kind of gray illumination, not light, but a kind of emanation from the walls so that it was possible to describe the farther world, to make out other passages leading away from the central corridor. Then the wind came. It came in a furious blast, accompanied by a mounting bedlam of voices which sounded like a distant outcry of screams and curses of undulations and agonized wails riding the wind. And as I stared fixedly outward, it seemed to me that the wind itself bore along with it countless faces, saurian, reptilian, bactrian, all bewailing their bondage to the crypts below the nameless city. They flowed past in a never-ending stream, their brute mouths open in their outcry against this fate which doomed them forever to ride the terrible specter wind whose arctic temperature penetrated to where we lay and chilled to the bone. Whence came they? From what vast underground reaches did the wind rise to sweep forth nightly upon its rounds over the desert places which few human feet ever trod? And by what accursed sorcery were they so bound to this inferno of darkness? Was it indeed that the drawings on the walls told in truth of the decay and ending of that ancient civilization which had stood long before the time of man, and that there was somewhere still deeper in this earth such a subterranean paradise as that depicted on the walls, a paradise in which there was light as of sunlight, and in which the gardens and valleys were fertile beyond the dreams of men who walked upon the desert above? Or was it this paradise had in its turn fallen before the invaders who had conquered the nameless city, the minions of some hellish being perhaps worshipped, perhaps unknown among the dwellers of that place? The wind's icy fury added to the cacophony of the terrible voices made a shocking clamor in this enclosed place. It rang deafeningly so that I had perforce to clap my hands over my ears lest I suffer the bursting of my eardrums. Professor Shrewsbury did likewise, and together we lay so for half an hour, perhaps more, before the shrieking blast of the wind had blasted beyond our place of concealment, leaving only a steady, unhurried flowing of cold air moving to the surface above. Now, said my employer, but be careful. I could not say what guardians may have been placed at the tomb of Alzared. The ascent to the desert place where the shifting sands hid the face of the nameless city was interminable. From time to time my employer stopped and turned his sightless eyes back to face the darkness with his own. Now and then I thought I could not be sure that I heard scuffling sounds as of hidden pursuers, but Professor Shrewsbury said nothing, only hurrying faster to mount the precipitous stairs towards the uncertain haven of the starlit desert far overhead. The caverns and corridors rang with our footsteps. The icy wind whipped around our ankles. 
The dwindling voices still sounded with a ghost-like insistence from far ahead of us. From out on the desert, where they scattered and were diminished over the sands before being drawn in once more and consigned again to that waiting place deep down below. There was soon no doubt but that there were pursuers behind us, but of their nature I had no conception. My employer did not seem unduly disturbed, but I observed that he urged me to hasten, and himself forged ahead with increased haste, murmuring that our camels might have been frightened by the wind and gone off, that our guides and porters would most certainly have begun to despair of us, for it was now the second night since our departure from the camp at the oasis, where first we had become aware of the wind. By this time, too, I was unbelievably weary and exhausted, not having slept for more than forty hours, and feeling the need acutely, because I could no longer seem to distinguish between the reality all around me and the illusion of sights and sounds into which I found myself falling with increasing frequency. But at last we reached the surface, and though our camels were not immediately to be seen, they were not far away. They had evidently taken fright at the voice of the wind and had moved away from the mouth of the pit, from which a little whirlpool of sand still came in the wind, and out of which doubtless at the height of the blast from below a veritable sandstorm must have risen. My employer seemed now possessed of an almost unseemly haste, he leapt upon his camel as soon as the beast had knelt for him and urged the creature forward with brisk commands. The course we had to follow was clearly indicated by the direction of the wind, which was certain to lead us to the oasis below the nameless city, even as it had led us on the previous night to the site of the city itself. As before, the night was dark. The glittering stars were partially hidden by clouds which rode high over the desert and shone with a kind of macabre glowing as from some dark inner light which had only a spectral reality and there was no sound beyond the sounds our camels made and the hushing of the wind now a steady movement to the south from time to time professor shrewsbury cast glances backward but if he saw anything in the starlit expanse behind us he gave no sign yet there was an undeniable aura of fear which rode with us it could not be gainsaid that our invasion of the tomb of the mad Arab Abdul Azared had loosed forces beyond our power to foresee, and to the warning against molestation of the remains in the sarcophagus had been unmistakable, even though my employer had remained undaunted in the face of it. Clearly, if there were nothing in the desert between the nameless city and ourselves, Professor Shrewsbury expected something to be there, or to come from that shunned ruin so seldom trodden by the foot of man, for his attitude bespoke his fear, not of the minions of the Ancient Ones, for he feared them not, but of the powers which the Ancient Ones themselves could command and send forth to do their bidding. Once there was a ghastly undulation far beyond us, like a creature baying on our trail, but that sound came from no throat known to mankind. An added sound the professor pressed his camel still more, and the beast itself, as if aware of an eldritch horror behind it, became more animated and heated its driver. Yet despite the manifest chill of the fear of an unknown terror, we reached the camp at the oasis without incident. There we found that our guides and porters had deserted to a man, but they had providentially left behind them enough provisions to see us once again safely back in Salala or Damkut. That we did eventually reach Damkut seems to me now in retrospect evidence that if we were being pursued as I am convinced we were, we were also under protection other than that afforded us by the grave five-pointed stones bearing the seal of the Elder Gods. It was on our fourth night out of the oasis below the nameless city that I caught sight of something that flew between us and the stars. My employer was immediately apprehensive, but his sightless eyes, through the strange power he had enabled him to identify our winged companions, for they flew ever in our vicinity. The Bayaki, he murmured, after an examination of the skies. I had thought some of them must be in the vicinity of the nameless city. For one moment I feared it might be the wind walker, Ithaqua against whom I am afraid our talisman would be of no avail. But no, 
If these are here, there are others. Who follows us? I asked. The dwellers of the city, he answered enigmatically. But there were no dwellers in the nameless city, I protested. I thought you saw them rising from the gulf. Those drawings? Were they real? I asked. Oh, yes. There was a civilization in that place which antedates mankind, Saurian and reptilian, followers of Cthulhu. I thought you had understood. The nameless city was at one time a sea city, buried far under the ocean's surface eons ago, long before the upheaval which brought that portion of Arabia to the surface and sent the waters away, leaving the aquatic inhabitants of that world to die out of their element beneath the blazing sun which followed the cataclysm. What cataclysm? I have no doubt it was the same which sank the lost continents of Atlantis and Mu, and that in turn may well have been the deluge of the Christian mythos. I assure you, Mr. Colum, there are many disturbing and provocative accounts in the ancient books which are hardly corroborative of the oldest legends, persisting in one form or another form from generation to generation. So the followers of Cthulhu perished here, save for those at the lowermost depth, which gave rise to water still, and also to the icy wind which courses upward to the desert and returns. There they are still, but of such nature that they are no longer subject to all our dimensional laws and pursue us in that same apparitional shape we saw before reaching the nameless city. Thereafter, I watched for those curious Saurian creatures, and indeed they were all around us, appearing and disappearing with uncanny facility, offering us no difficulty beyond cutting off our third camel with some of our provisions, a loss which was somewhat alleviated by our purchase of provisions from a caravan encountered halfway to Salala en route to Oman. What happened to the beast we did not know. It had been cut off during the night, but our own camels were unmolested, perhaps because they were closer to us than the third beast had been. The Baiki were visible on three nights between the oasis near the nameless city and the port of Damkot, but they shunned civilization and its cities. Yet it was in the cities and along the coast that my employer most feared the menace of pursuit, and immediately upon reaching Salala, he made an accurate copy of the precious map and posted it to an address in London, following it with a second copy posted to an address in Singapore, both to be held pending his arrival. The fragmentary manuscript, however, he retained on his person. Having done this, he faced the remainder of our trip with greater equanimity, though he was still in no illusion as to the nature of our voyage. And in this, certainly, he was not unduly pessimistic. For though our journey from Damkut to Mukalla and finally Aden was comparatively peaceful and without the alarms which might have been anticipated, the voyage from Aden into the Red Sea on our way to the Suez and the Mediterranean was beset with all manners of difficulties. Almost at once Professor Shrewsbury observed that the dock workers busy loading the ship on which we had taken passage, the Sana, appeared to be curiously deformed, so that the majority of them gave the aspect of hopping and shuffling at their work, rather than of walking in orthodox fashion. It was not too noticeable. Undoubtedly, most passerbys who glanced at them saw nothing, but to a trained observer like my employer, the significance of the dock workers' trait was not lost. It was possibly explained that their presence was nothing more than a coincidence, in Massachusetts, certain coastal towns harbored a surprising number of the descendants of a horrible experiment in crossbreeding between the natives and the deep ones. Such experiments need not be considered to have been confined to one area of the globe. For these dock workers strongly resembled certain residents of Innsmouth, Massachusetts, and the hill country around Dunwich, where other hybrid peoples once flourished. But the dock workers offered us no difficulties, and it was not until we were well out of a den on our way up the Red Sea that my employer became conscious of the nature of our pursuit. He came to my cabin only last night in marked agitation. You saw them, 
he asked without preamble, referring to aquatic pursuers. I nodded. The deep ones, certainly, he said, but there is something more. Listen. At first I heard nothing but the sound of the ship's passage. Then slowly, insidiously, I became aware of another sound, one that should not have been out on the sea. The shuddersome sound of ponderous steps moving through a great depth of swampy or boggy soil, distant treading and sucking sounds. You hear? Yes, what is it? It is something other than the deep ones, something against whom our armor is too weak. You have the golden mead and the whistle. You remember the formula? I assured him that I did. Be prepared to use them, but the time is not yet. It is now late in the following day. Early this afternoon, a storm brewing from our rear burst upon us, and its fury has been mounting steadily ever since. Wind, lightning, thunder, and torrents of rain have engulfed the sauna, and the violence of the storm appears to be mounting. I have set down this account specifically so that such of my effects as are held in London will continue to be held, pending word of my death, for my employer assures me that the time for that is not yet. He has made it clear, too, that it would seem to be a matter of making our escape, or of permitting the needless sacrifice of everyone on board to Santa, which he intends to prevent. Professor Shrewsbury has just looked in to say that it is time. He had taken some of the golden mead. He has his whistle ready. I can see him from where I sit writing. I can hear him shouting into the storm, Ya, ya, hastur! He stands upright against the fury of the storm. He falls back only before, a lashing tentacle from the deep below. And then the birds. Great God, what beings, what spawn of some forgotten hell! But he mounts one of them unafraid. Something thrusts hard against the ship. Something comes just too late to seize its prey. I know what I must do. From the Log of the Santa the storm of Friday caused the loss of two passengers. Professor Laban Shrewsbury and Naylan Collum, who were traveling together, both were seen outside their cabins despite the violence of the storm, and were presumed to have been swept off into the sea and drowned. Though the storm abated with remarkable suddenness immediately after the loss of these passengers, no trace of them could be found. The proper forms have been forwarded.